Welcome to this Global Design Forum talk, part of this year's London Design Festival. I'm Peter Kapos, I'm a design historian, and I'm very pleased today to be in conversation with curator Jana Schulzer. Um, we're going to be discussing Braun Design, um, its beginnings, um, its cultural conditions and contexts, and we'll be looking at how it developed from a somewhat chaotic, ad hoc feeling the way through to something uh, a little bit more systematic and rigorous. Uh, so we're discussing um, Braun Design uh, under some slightly strange uh, conditions. Um, so we're going to stay on opposite sides of the table and wave to each other throughout. I will handle the object. Um, Hopefully we'll have a, an interesting discussion despite those difficult conditions. I mean, difficult conditions is a sort of, um, it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting kind of area. Um, when we're thinking about brown design, we are thinking about difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're, you're in Germany in the period of reconstruction, you're living amongst the rubble still for many people, even in the mid-1950s, you know, the, Absolutely. The continent's been completely devastated. Um, so the beginning of brand design is, I think, interesting in relation to, to that situation, um, the, to those difficulties. Um, this is a brown radio from 1954. And in a way, you know, the reference to precious metals is completely made of plastic, apart from this small metal fixing. You can understand why someone who's been through the war still needs the reassurance of familiar yeah. things, even when they're presented in the form of new materials. So there's something sort of slightly at odds with itself. It's plastic, which is a new material. It looks like gold. It has a kind of a reassuring aspect to it, but then it has a technological aspect to it. And which, you know, which do you want? Mm -hmm. There's this kind of ambivalence. The Ulm School um, in 1955 revised this design it's a kind of a proof of concept, so they use the, um, use the same tooling and produce something really quite, quite different. Mm -hmm. It seems now very rational and very severe. It's kind of, I think that maybe that's um, an interesting place to start, is, well, why would you want something that is rational opposed, as opposed to something which is maybe reassuring. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's... Uh... I feel in this respect, it is re really a nice collection of objects that you pulled out here. Um, because on the one side, I guess many people would most likely put these objects into pre-war mm. periods. And because they have a lot of resemblances in it, the plastic looks more like Bakelite, which right. is uh, a, a very kind of popular uh, material in pre-war war times. Yeah. This whole issue of um, pretending to be precious metal yeah, was, yeah. came through the kind of turn of the century um, as a way of making objects available to people, sharing objects with people who couldn't afford uh, precious materials and, and hence very expensive objects. The, also the, the organic in yeah. these objects yeah. is probably uh, something that we see very much uh, as, as a pre-war uh, idea. And I assume it is not surprising, probably, that in respect of a collaboration with a school, mm. a school that's set up to be extremely radical, extremely yeah. political as an art school, um, to, to kind of really rethink what these designs are, and not necessarily thinking about the consumer as something, or the product as something to reassure the consumer. Yeah, it's almost sort of the opposite. It's almost like, rather than reassure the consumer, it's, um, it's almost educating. It's almost saying, well, you know, we don't have to live in this kind of fantasy world of reassuring mm -hmm. heavy curtains. Yeah. You know, instead we can be, we can live in this new world that we can build. We have Absolutely. the resources to do it, we have the knowledge to do it, we can live in a world that we create ourselves using technology. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of utopian But way also of... we don't want to go back. Right. We don't want yeah. to go back to yeah, a time yeah. before. Probably what yeah. we would say here in Britain, the Festival of Britain did, yes. yeah. uh, in kind of giving people this 
idea that we want to live in a future world, in a new world, right. and we want to create something that is not anymore just a utopia, but that we could actually live with these new things and feel comfortable with yeah. them. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, in terms of that kind of future facingness of the design, it's, it's different in its tone from some of the kind of future facing 1950s designs of, in, that you find in America, which mm -hmm. takes, you know, which is a lot of excitement about the possibility of space travel. Yes. But this is very grounded. It mm -hmm. seems to be based in what's actually possible, what can actually be made now. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a kind of a future fantasy no. in the same way that this is a retrospective fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's a much more pragmatic, like these are the problems that we have now. This is the difficult situation that we encounter. Let's use our knowledge to overcome it and start to live like this. Mm -hmm. So these are almost like proposals for how life yep. should and can be lived, mm -hmm. given, the, the, given the resources and the knowledge that we have. We have to remind ourselves, of course, the Bauhaus has proposed right. kind of a, a new type of living mm. in the 30s mm. and in the 20s even. Yeah. However, that was not how everyone lived. Yeah. And, and the war kind of stopped this experiment to happen yeah. and be translated. Yeah. And except for probably things like the Weisnow uh, estate in, in Stuttgart, that was still in, seen as an experiment of living, not yeah. as an everyday yeah. part. So there, there was still kind of work to be done that had started much, much earlier to convince people of this new world yeah. that uh, felt comfortable with yeah. technology yeah. and not frightened by yeah. it. And it's interesting to think about Brown in relation to, to the Bauhaus, because mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right that it, it, with the Bauhaus it was still a kind of, it was quite speculative. Mm -hmm. It hadn't yet been, well, it hadn't been mass produced. So it was a, the proposal was to mass produce, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. because of the interruption of the war, um, because the market was not quite ready to receive it, it was only really proposed. And mm -hmm. the Ulm School as the kind of the post-war continuation of the, of mm -hmm. the Bauhaus with this client mm -hmm. um, were for the first time maybe able to really mass yeah. produce. So this was um, this very utopian, very idealistic, modernist design that they had dreamt about in the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. now finally in mass production mm -hmm. um, and available for, in a very, in a completely democratic way, yep. available in shops. Mm -hmm. um, there are various versions of the Snow White Coffin. Yeah. Why, why was that? Um, well, they kept pushing the technology. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this was, this is the first version of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, that I think some of the, some of the problems with it as a design are interesting because they reflect the working conditions. Absolutely. So, yes. you know, they had a lot of different designers feeding into this. Um, so Willem Wagenfeld has done the phono module, Hans Gugelo has done the enclosure, Lindinger, Herbert Lindinger has mm -hmm. arranged the controls, Otto Eicher has supplied the tuning scale, Dieter Rams has given the Perspex lid. And, you know, they're, they're shuttling prototypes between Ulm and Kronberg in the backs of cars. And it's a oh, bit wow. of a kind of, um, mm -hmm. like, after-dinner party game, almost, with different people adding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it sort of starts like this. It's a little bit at odds with itself. The phono module is really like Wagenfeld's thing, so mm -hmm. it's very organic. Um, and it, that's slightly at odds with the more severe industrial character. So. As they updated it, they mm -hmm. kind of pulled his phono module out and Dieter Rams put in two different two. versions which were sort of progressively sort of more, more suited, I think, to the, to the enclosure. But I, I think kind of partly what's interesting is that this stays in production for such a long time. There's something about it that works for consumers. I so. think it's probably because it has this transitional yeah. feeling yeah. that is... Uh, that it fits into a home without being felt as an obstruction or right. uh, as, as really an alien object that yeah. comes. Um, one point that I find really important that you mentioned is the type of collaboration that yeah, was absolutely. needed. That was typical of Braun for a long time, for always. Yeah, well, I mean, it was, it was certainly typical um, of the period where 
they were working with the OM school and they had no internal design department yet. Absolutely. So all of the designers were freelancers apart from Dieter Rams um, and Fritz Eichler, who was a more of a creative director working within the company. So they were very dependent on outside, mm -hmm. outside resources. Um, but the result was a sl slightly chaotic program. You know? So they had um, Herbert Hirsch was doing his thing, Hans Guzlo was doing his thing, then Wagenfeld had a couple of little products. Uh, it was sort of almost like different silos of kind mm. of approach. Um, when they finally created an internal design department, mm -hmm. that was the point at which they were able to really focus their approach, and that's when they implemented a plan that Ulm mm -hmm. had supplied to them, and then they stopped working with the school mm -hmm. and spent the 60s rolling out this kind of very heroic program, essentially. Absolutely. It's not just born, it's not just, it is, the 50s is a time where also globally mm. many companies kind of change to recognize design as something that they need, that not only right. engineers kind of design their products and they just need a case for something, yeah. but that the design is translating yeah. Uh, yeah. to a customer's enable kind of accessibility, yeah. etc. Yeah. So it is a time where this move happens yeah. where, where designers are kind of becoming industrial designers in, right. in the zero sense. Yeah, and it's the beginning really of, um, of, of consumerism and of, and of mass markets and mm -hmm. mass manufacture for mass markets. Mm -hmm. I, and it, what's, I think, kind of curious is, I mean, you can see it in particular with the Ulm School, where on the one hand there's this utopianism mm -hmm. where they feel that okay, you know, like we can reorganize the world's resources using science and rational thinking to create a utopia. We don't have to mm -hmm. live in fear of nature anymore. It's mm -hmm. like for the first point in the history of the species, we're standing at the point where we can control everything. Mm -hmm. We've got the resources and the means yeah. to do it. We mm -hmm. can do it. It's the, that's the potential, and it doesn't mm -hmm. work out that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at that moment, they were, there's this sort of threshold that they're standing at, and at the same time, it's the beginning of consumer capitalism, of marketing, and design is sort of in this odd position of being, on the one hand, in the service of a, of a utopia, and in the other hand, at the service of marketing and of stimulating consumer desire. And in Germany, with the so-called economic miracle, you know, this huge explosion of consumer mm -hmm. capitalism that happened in the 60s that mm -hmm. made Germany the economic powerhouse that Absolutely. it's remained mm -hmm. ever since. Um, what, what, what's the position of design? Um, so that's a sort of a curious, almost a sort of a choice. Yeah. I think also the, the complexity in this positioning, mm. you know, whether, and, and I think it is an ongoing discussion, which yeah. we still have, sure. how much design is part of driving consumption or how much design is really enabling probably or aspiring a better world yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. allowing a better world to happen yeah, in yeah, whatever yeah. We, we assume this better world is. Yeah. And, and I think that is a, is a position that we yeah. still see yeah. kind of outplayed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think if you, unless you're going to be absolutely pessimistic, if you think that human beings are still capable of creating mm -hmm. a world that's fit for human beings to live in, mm -hmm then design as a kind of a conscious forming of material, of making the world, has to have a role. Absolutely. Mm. And at the same time, so it's, there's a better world, we, we have to hope, mm. we have to believe that. And on the other side, it's quite clear that design at the moment is feeding into a progressively worsening world mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's directly leading to, well, I mean, there are many different kind of crises that are occurring at the moment, mm -hmm. but one of them, and you know, before them, for the crisis that's keeping us on either side of this table, <laughs> there's an environmental crisis, Absolutely. which and is a huge ticking clock. The you know, pandemic which... is most likely part of this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. and there's a clear connection between them. Coming back to mm. the 1950s, yeah. I think what also the difference probably of the early 50s objects to yeah. already the Snow White Coffin is, is this very often talked about honesty, honesty right. in kind of presenting the materials as they are, yeah, not yeah. kind of trying to disguise anything yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I think that's so true. I mean, that's really clear, I think, with this. Yes. With the honesty of not pretending that plastic is metal mm -hmm. or that plastic is gold, yes. which is a kind of such, such a foolish thing to do. It's Absolutely. A, it's absurd. But also in a way... having in a hierarchy of material. Right, exactly, kind exactly. Of valuing. And instead you can think about a different kind of value, which is just care. Right, Very so true. like the selection mm. of this, you know, mm -hmm. slotted fixing, which emphatically puts that tuning dial yes. in that position. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that doesn't need to look like gold. No. You know, to, to you recognise the the attention, the care, the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's enough. I think one one point that uh, this transition between the early fifties objects and and the later fifties mm. objects. It's the question of honesty, which mm, mm. has been discussed uh, in the connection with, with the Ohm school, but mm. also with, with brown design in, in general mm. uh, quite a lot. And I feel we have kind of a huge kind of step then to the object on this side, right. you know, to, to kind of say probably there, there, the radicalness was in the material and honestly showing the materials without yeah. covering, without kind of disguising. Yeah. Um, but what we see here is a radical step. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so this is, this is 1956, this is 1959, and they're, not, mm. they're really very close together. Um, I mean, th in some ways this is sort of, I think um, it's, it's, it's honest to a certain extent. Absolutely. But it, mm. it, or it has some misgivings about itself. Mm -hmm. so it's still not, it's not completely honest about mm -hmm. what it is. It's mm -hmm. still, um, I guess it's partly, um, it's partly almost like a category issue that it doesn't mm -hmm. know whether it's furniture or audio. Yes. So it, it can be, like it doesn't have to hide anymore inside a drinks cabinet or it mm -hmm. doesn't have to look like some piece of Baroque furniture. So it's not hidden. But it still looks a little bit like modernist furniture, Absolutely. maybe. So it's not quite yet itself a radio or yeah. radiogram. But also it fits into interiors far more easily than something for sure. like this. Yeah. Which yeah. I think was, for many people at the time, a, a too radical step to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I still find this record player and tuner, this system, uh, it's pretty challenging even now. I mean, it's yes. so industrial. It's, I mean, it was the first piece of audio equipment that was entirely made of metal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> apart from the, the sort of the softening of the Perspex hood. Um, it's really, it's really tough. You know, at this time in the, in the late 50s, there are lots of manufacturers who are making these hi-fi audio separates. But no one is thinking about what the relationship between these parts are, mm -hmm. given that these things are objects that have a spatial relation to each other and also have a relation to an operator, to a user. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time really that anyone has given consideration to what, a, what an audio system is as, as an arrangement of modules, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a... Um, uh, the thesis um, of uh, Herbert, Herbert Lindinger, which is, um, so he was a student at Ulm, yes. and it was part of the way that the, s that the school was set up, that students would work on projects that were like live projects run by the college for industry. So mm -hmm. he was working on the Brown project, and this is um, his diploma thesis, where he's trying to work out how these modules can fit together, and there are these now really, I think, very sweet little drawings of cubes where, yeah. you know, he's considering, well, this is the front and this is the top, and how do these cubes need to be related to each other to and allow... Him, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's really... It's like trying to invent the wheel, essentially. Now absolutely. it just seems absolutely commonsensical that you yes. would do that. So this little pocket radio, is, is this already an, an object that uh, addresses miniaturization? Yeah, absolutely, and it's, it's born out of that, that drive towards mini miniaturization. So this is, this is portable, it has a mm -hmm. handle, but this is pocketable. Mm -hmm. And that, between this and this, it, this is the, um, you know, it's the end of the 1950s. There's, always, there's already been a huge development, but it's, it's, at the very, it's at the point then, at the end of the 1950s, the beginning of the 1960s, where 
on the one hand, these small devices shoot off into a universe of small interconnected devices, and on the other hand, these shoot off and become big, mm -hmm. fixed position, super heroic, mm -hmm. grand systems. Mm -hmm. So on, on this table, um, we've got the, the results of um, that thinking at the very end of the 50s, where they were thinking about how can, how can you organize devices into, into systems. These are, um, this is the kind of the, the lighter, more affordable branch of that thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, small, lightweight, transistorized devices, radio, speaker, record player, speaker, another radio, pocket radios. And this, um, from 1959, um, it's a pocket radio, transistorized, and it connects to this battery-operated record player. It's held together in this tray with a leather strap, so it's portable. I'll just turn the radio on. It is really the first Walkman. Absolutely. Or what we what we see later yeah. on, and yes, you can so nicely see it how yeah. you take it to a picnic. And yeah, and that's the you know it doesn't sound great, but no. it's not really intended to. It's just for the first time you got the possibility of being in a park with music. Absolutely, you know, it's, it's sort of extraordinary to walk around, create your environment right. with your music uh, wherever you are. It is such a radical idea, I think, that uh, which we haven't seen before, you know, before yeah. in, in the 50s you really had the objects encased, it was furniture and it was very clear where they belonged to. Yeah. And this is a radical step, kind of, I, this idea of going out, using the world where it is, which is part of the system thinking, Right, I guess. right, yeah. No, I mean, it's, and it's a new way of thinking about, about, about use, um, yeah. because it's not only, well, this thing can be useful because you can switch it on, it can produce music in the home. It can, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's thinking about well, what, do, what, do, what do humans need, mm -hmm. you know, and partly it's the, you know, they, they need to go out into the world. And so it's a, it's a system which is adapted to, mm -hmm. you know, to that, that requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is like a, a, almost like a little world of mm -hmm. small transistorized units that can be useful themselves. Um, so this is a, a radio, which is self-contained as a radio, but it can also be connected to other devices. So it's being produced with ports that allow it to be connected to another speaker, or it can be connected to a record player, um, and then it can be the amplifier for the record player, and you've got a slightly larger sound from that speaker. So it's the sort of idea of um, these things linking up together in different arrangements. There's a kind of a freedom and a flexibility about the way that they relate to each other that sort of sort of mirrors the sort of idea of freedom and flexibility, which Absolutely. you know is about the way that you might live. I think. And an idea that we see today integrated, you know, we connect our headphones to our telephone right. to uh, a speaker externally yeah. and without thinking, where I think here we have still three really distinct uh, objects mm. uh, which, which we don't necessarily see in this relationship and it's yeah. interesting to see how, how it all started. Where do we see the relationship where, from here to there? In, in this radio? I mean, these are, they're, they're, they're producing um, very large numbers that are just very slight variations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they have, they're slightly different. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a price hierarchy. You have mm -hmm. different functions and it's priced, priced accordingly. So it's but more it's, the technology that is, sits inside. Yeah, exactly. Which, yeah. which is really nice to see that actually the outside design that we see and, and that kind of allows us to interact with the object yeah. has been done perfectly the first time around. Right. So and it didn't and there's this kind of problem. systematic relation which isn't only functional. It's not only to do with how these different mm -hmm. devices that perform in different ways can be, can be connected. There's also a kind of a system regarding their, their form. Probably this is also a good moment mm. to speak about um, colour. Colour's not performing the purpose of shouting at you from a shelf. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want your attention as a consumer. 
It's not trying to get your attention. The colour is there in order to help you to use it. So with these radios, the red indicates the FM button. Mm -hmm. And that, that's it. And you recognise that because it's the only, it's the only spot of colour. Mm -hmm. So it's doing quite a lot of work. I mean, typically the, the power switch is maybe a sage green. That's mm -hmm. the only colour on, mm -hmm. the, on the device. And it, it's, it's important for, for hierarchical reasons. It tells you where Absolutely. the most important functions mm -hmm. are and your eye is sort of drawn to them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's helping you to use the object. It's not, it's not shouting at you to try to get your attention to part with some cash, which is it's, a very different I, I way of thinking about, yes. about design, I think. I think it's really important to kind of indicate that because it's so often misunderstood as a non-interest in colour. Right, or some kind of like um, sackcloth, mm -hmm. you know, denial of colour or a kind of puritanism. Mm -hmm. It's really about, um, it's about, it's actually a generosity to the mm -hmm. user. It's about thinking what does the user need so that they can mm -hmm. intuitively engage with, it, with this object. The object has to be self-clarifying, mm -hmm. has to explain its functions. Mm -hmm. And it does that using colour um, mm. and also the arrangement of controls, the relative scale of controls, their positioning. I think important also what you mentioned before, you know, the object doesn't want to be the centre of attention. It yeah. doesn't want to shout at you to kind of say, here I am. Yeah. It kind of fulfills a function. It allows you to have the music during yeah. the picnic, yeah. but it's not the centre. Yeah, piece. exactly. It doesn't, need to be, it doesn't need to be celebrated mm -hmm. by the picnickers. It's mm -hmm. not something to be worshipped. It's just there to... To perform a task. Yes. I think it's also important that it's that that there's some consideration given to the fact that our world is created partly out of the the the, the sum of the objects that are gathered mm -hmm. together. So a product doesn't exist in isolation. It has to live with other products. Mm -hmm. And if your product is very is shouting, then it's going to join a group of objects which are shouting. And the result is going to be an environment which is not very pleasant. No. So if, if you consider that there are going to be many other products, then they should all be a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. And then something else can happen in that space that's created. I think it's probably also respect to kind of say at the centre of all this is still the human being. Right. Yeah. Where it's not an object that we celebrate, and yeah. which we quite often misunderstand today, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the objects are so central to everything that we do. Yeah. And which is quite important to kind of see how old this history is. Yeah, that's right. And, and probably that there were solutions. One way why we talk about history, yeah. I guess, is that there might have been kind of indications, attitudes beforehand in the design that we should come back to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. One important point in this, of course, from our perspective in mm. the 21st century is, of course, that this allows us a far more sustainable kind of view on these objects to think about if the object is not a fashionable item that I'm kind of changing whenever the season changes. So at the same time that Brown are producing this universe of small, lightweight, portable devices that can be connected in sort of various relations, mm. they're also producing these much more heroic, heavy hi-fi systems. And these really are geared towards very high quality sound production. And, you know, the radios are in today's money, maybe 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. And something like this would have been just shy of the cost of, uh, of a new Volkswagen Beetle. So there, it's really a, mm -hmm. a serious commitment mm -hmm. um, and a very different market. Um, so this is, on the one hand, it's also modular. Mm -hmm. So it's still keeping that sense of, of systems design. Mm -hmm. But once it's, it's arranged, it's, it's pretty much fixed. So mm -hmm. it's, it's modular at the point where you're looking through the catalog. Once you've made your selection, it's, it's a serious commitment. And then that's, that commitment is almost, in this case, like expressed in the fact that this is fixed to the wall. <laughs> it's sort of, there's true. something really kind of um, mm. strangely kind of almost permanent, mm -hmm. I think, about that. And it, it, you feel that in the, in the materials. Um, there's something... It, that's not, you can't really negotiate with this. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. it's such an emphatic statement, it's this. And the flexibility is, I think it's curious because on the one hand, it seems like um, 
it's, it's absolutely the way it is. And yet there's this curious relation to furniture where, whereas before with the SK4, you know, we had this sort of ambivalence mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's kind of audio equipment, it's kind of furniture. Mm -hmm. And this is sharing the same language as the furniture that Dieter Rams was designing for Vitsu and audio equipment simultaneously. And it's not that it's a little bit furniture, a little bit shelving, a little yeah. bit audio. Somehow all of that now has become absorbed within a single language, a single formal and material vocabulary. So in some respects, we are back to the idea of the Bauhaus to form a Gesamtkunstwerk. Absolutely, yeah. And th that is interesting to see also in, in questions of we are really celebrating the music here. Yeah. It is not something that we do sometimes. It is really right there. And it's, it, I find it also really interesting that it only works with the shelving system, that yeah. this is the option that you get, uh, that two manufacturers in some respects produce something right. that kind of connects with each other and yeah. relates to each other. But again, it's this idea of, of, a, of, of a total environment. Yes. So if when we had the, with, the, with the radios, there, there's some diversity between them, but also a very high degree of unity. Mm -hmm. And that's reproduced at a kind of a much grander scale, mm -hmm. potentially in a domestic interior where your shelving system, your audio system, all of your household objects, your desk fan, your kitchen equipment, your coffee grinder, mm -hmm. your seating, your storage, every visible object can cohere and be part of a, mm -hmm. a, single, a single universe. Of this world. Yeah, it's, ex it's extraordinary. And I, I think there's a kind of a criticism of the, uh, which is often made of this kind of approach, which is that it's sort of, there's something totalitarian or fascist about it, you know, that it's sort of, that it, it's sort of imposing mm -hmm. something on the user. I kind of think it's, it's completely the opposite, actually. Mm. It's, it's more um, when there is that level of, of unity and when all of these objects are somehow settling together, then it creates space. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually not something being imposed on the user, it's the opposite. It's creating a space in which the user can just get on with other stuff. Mm -hmm. At the like same not time, dominated by the yes. environment. At the same time, I, I think it also shows us the big difference between the 1950s and the 1960s, right. where we are confident about technology. Yes, yeah, we are absolutely. celebrating yeah. this. We see this yeah. as, as allowing us freedom in yeah, the kitchen yeah. to kind of, you know, buy all the machines that can help us yeah. to make things easier without kind of concentrating on house, housework yeah. to not have. These but also that kind of timidity of the 50s, Absolutely. you know, which is linked in some mm. ways to austerity and to a trauma mm -hmm. that's quite recent. Mm -hmm. And it, it produces a kind of ambivalence in relation to which direction do you go in in all mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's this confidence and there's also this money because mm -hmm. consumers have money again. Um, yeah, it's a very different, it's a very different environment. It's, it's probably also an interesting um, relationship to the pop culture that happens yeah, around yeah. this in, in the 60s. And, and I think these objects are more allowed a celebration of life yeah. in, in many ways where, where they might not shout out in bright oranges or right. reds yeah, yeah. Uh, because that is not the ethos that is behind making these products, but it allows a very different life to exist. Brown's very well known for the audio equipment, particularly of the, of the 1960s, but of course the company was also producing in product in many categories. It wasn't only audio, that was just part of the, the, the Braun program. Mm -hmm. So on this table we've got a um, coffee grinder, um, home tan, a lamp, desk fan, shavers, mm -hmm flash units and a little portable projector. I mean, the shavers maybe are, um, although they maybe they seem like they're the most modest, but they're the most, in some ways, the most important objects on the table because shaver sales were absolutely essential to, to the Braun business and in many ways um, made the kind of very heroic, grand, audio projects possible because 
those projects were not very successful on the market mm -hmm. and had to be subsidised by more successful categories such as such as shaving. So it's I think it's it's really important to see that that the there is a there's a program of of products and you know the more exciting um, more heroic audio mm. adventures mm. are really just one moment within um, a plan which is considerably more extensive. So tell me a little bit more about the shavers because in so many respects they are have become such iconic objects mm. that I think in my generation everyone has some relative where you think like I can see them still yeah. my father makes a shaver like this and and it's just it's such an haptic kind of experience of this yeah. object it fits perfectly Absolutely. into the hand it kind of just does what it needs to do and there is nothing you just switch this one switch on and yeah. you, you start using it. Yeah, I mean, the relationship between these two shavers mm. is, is interesting because the, the white shaver, um, 1961, it still belongs to a 1950s, mm -hmm. a kind of health anxiety. It, it's, it's part of a, a language of, um, of medical equipment. Mm -hmm. So all of the shavers, um, and, until this shaver, chrome shear heads and cream white plastic bodies. Oh right, no and other colours were. There was there was black used infrequently. Mm -hmm. It was largely largely white, and I think it's to do with this, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this kind of anxiety that's still a hangover from the war, and then but the it was appearance. But a very modernist idea. Yeah. Kind of hygienic objects or objects that you can clean yeah. easily that show the dirt. True, yeah. yeah. And I think perhaps also this a sense of it being medical equipment. Absolutely, yes. You know, which is advanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in, in 1962, there was this new, a new vocabulary mm -hmm. opened up with this, this mm -hmm. shaver, which is a little bit... Um, it has a, I mean, it, it's, it's physically the same weight as the other, but visually it's much heavier. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, maybe uh, the beginning of a different kind of a relation to shavers. It's a I think it's specifically a male mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. relation to shavers. And it's, it, that it can't be light. No. It needs to have. Yeah, and it's energy. about, uh, it, I think it's about the product um, beginning to define a certain understanding of masculinity. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, this cream um, and chrome is a, it, it's, it's not a, it, it's, it's a, although it's a, it's a shaver, it's not specifically a gendered object mm -hmm. because it belongs to a kind of a universe of medicine, which is more universal mm -hmm. in its application. This, with, a, with, a, with this heavy black body and a, and a brushed steel shear head, it starts to become part of more of a, um, I think more of a lifestyle sense of what, of what masculinity is and mm -hmm. what being a man is. Something which now is maybe starting to, we're starting to look again and mm -hmm. wonder whether or mm -hmm. not that's, that's all that useful now. I think mm -hmm. at, at the time it was performing a different kind of use. Now those uses have, um, we're beginning to revise them again. But also looking after you. And, and I guess it is a transition from kind of looking after you in a medical sense, yeah. that you stay healthy, mm. to looking after you probably in a more fashionable sense as well, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's like, the, it's like the distinction between a medical body, which is biological mm -hmm. and needs to work in a certain way, needs to be kept, mm -hmm. needs, you know, it, it needs, to be, um, needs to be maintained, and a kind of a cultural life. Mm -hmm. It's a different, a biological life and a cultural life mm -hmm. where your, it's a social life, it's about being, about being a man and what, mm. that, what that might mean and what kind of equipment you might need to show mm -hmm. that you're a certain kind of man. Absolutely. Um, I think um, well, one thing which is sort of interesting is the, the different ways in which systems are expressed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the flash system, um, the, 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 the fact that the battery unit can be separated mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the thing that determines the form of the object mm -hmm. as a whole. This is a coffee grinder. It's a completely different kind of object. Mm -hmm. And this is also a system, but it's a system which is about how, how do you describe the transition from beans that will live in the caddy 
to grounds that are mm -hmm. going to come out of this container here. And you know, the beans are the cylindrical part, the caddy is the cuboid part, <laughs> and the cylinder that joins the two, it's cylindrical but because it's got a motor inside it mm -hmm. which rotates. So it's very beautifully articulating that that transition from beans to grounds mm -hmm. and at the same time articulating the mechanical facts mm -hmm. of the object. So it's sort of working on a number of levels at the same time and it, it's, I, I find it really incredible that that can be expressed in a coffee grinder and mm -hmm. it can take this shape. Something else very different is expressed in the battery relation to the, to the, mm -hmm. to the flash units but they're still systematically coordinated. Mm -hmm. So this coffee grinder has its own language, this has its own language, and yet they also share a language. Mm. It's, a very, it's an odd kind of communication across, across categories. Now, also because I feel, in, in many ways, the form is not kind of accidental. Yeah. It really is related intrinsically to yeah. what, is, what function it performs and what technology yeah. is inside. Th that's a different kind of design, in a way, mm -hmm. to the one that we're familiar with now, where Absolutely. we think, oh, design is something which is really special and that has to be brought to the process by like a designer artist mm -hmm. who somehow leaves their signature on the object in the form of some kind of distinctive shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, Reinhold Weiss, when he's designing this, is not concerned to communicate Reinhold Weiss to anyone. Yeah. He's totally thinking about coffee grinding. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a kind of way of, it produces a, a way of thinking about design mm -hmm. which is applicable to every object that mm -hmm. exists in the world. It's mm -hmm. not really a special thing that gets added on top. I, I think one of the things that's kind of extraordinary about this fan is that it doesn't look like a fan. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of work out that it's a fan mm -hmm. if you, um, you analyse it. You know, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's the motor block, there's, there's the fan head, there's a cowl, yes. there's a base, there's a stem. All those parts are expressed um, and, and articulated clearly as separate parts. So again, it's a kind of systematic mm -hmm. relation, but it's, it's been given a kind of a sculptural treatment so that one part is sort of uh, almost porous or semi-transparent. Mm -hmm. This head, this is completely transparent. This is absolutely solid. Mm -hmm. and those varying densities mm -hmm. correspond to these different functions. And you can kind of work out that it's a fan, but the generic image of a fan didn't really play a part in this. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it sort of was just created out of a mechanical system. Mm -hmm, and that, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it expresses. So that is where, where we, we look at an object in, in kind of also as, as an object that kind of surrounds us, that we live with, that is not just a functional object that you want to kind of hide away as, as quickly as you can. Hmm. Mm. So. Why do we need to look at? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think it's, a, it's such a good question. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, why are we looking at these things which were which were made in the '60s and which, you know, are not made in this way any longer? I mean, I think that, you know, you can. There's a lot about the, the with the, the the speed with which um, with which products are, are produced and mm -hmm. stay on the market if a successful if a product is successful, it's five years in the market is considered mm -hmm. successful. You know, that's really, that's Absolutely. an achievement. Yes, yes. I mean, th th if you have a good coffee grinder, there is really no need to change it. Mm -hmm. And that, that but it, 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 it's a very different attitude from mm -hmm. a manufacturer in relation to, to the user, to consider them a user rather than a consumer mm -hmm. who needs to be kind of cajoled again into binning something which is perfectly good mm -hmm. because you know, something newer has come along. So this idea of producing something that is, that is really, really useful, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's repairable, it's durable, mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful to live with, mm -hmm. and there's no need to replace it. It just mm -hmm. keeps, on, it keeps on running. To make that commitment, mm -hmm. I think that's maybe something which, if we're thinking about well, what, what is the relevance of this for today's world, I think that's one of the things that maybe is really important about looking back. That mm -hmm. it, it, there are design principles that are still absolutely valid and absolutely mm -hmm. applicable. We have problems now, particularly environmental problems, absolutely. which demand that we start to you know, look back, I think, mm -hmm. because constantly looking 
looking forward for solutions, um, I think that can lead you again into novelty and... Also sometimes it is solutions that we have had mm -hmm. and disregarded and we need to come back with. And I think what, what happens with these uh, products is very often an idea of a much, much slower world, yeah. a world that is, has much more longevity in yeah. it, so there is no need to replace you. And that in itself, I think, is a different... It, it projects a different way of living. And like mm -hmm. you said, something, something much slower. Yes. And maybe for the future, that kind of thinking is really... It's not only desirable you know, existentially for individuals, mm -hmm. but it's, um, it's become a, a requirement. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more.